Thank you for having me here. Um, so yeah, that was a long tour. I started last week in Milton Keynes, and I was in London, and then in Norwich, and then uh, yesterday in Cambridge, today here. I'm testing, uh, driving on the left with uh, the right steering in a huge car, and it's not going too well. I'm happy I took the all, all, all insurance, in, including the TARS, because I get some damage for sure. So, um, long title, Automating, Automating Patterns with Aspect-Oriented Programming in PostSharp. Uh, so I started to work on PostSharp uh, 14 years ago, actually. Uh, how many of you heard about that? A few of you, okay, okay, maybe a third. How many of you used it? Just one or two, okay, three, uh, good. Um, so, so 14 years ago, and it, it, and it all started because I, I was bored and uh, I needed something to, to do. And so I, I started to write a post compiler, you know, what do you do when you are bored? So I write it to, to, to I, I started to implement a post compiler and then the first thing I did with that was aspect oriented programming. Um, and actually it became successful. At, at some point, PostScribe was the, I believe, the number two or three open source project in .NET in terms of size and audience and so on. And actually, the success of the project outgrew my capacity to maintain it. Uh, and I, I progressively, so at, at some point, I was working three days per week for money. I was consulting remotely and three days per week. The other three days I put in PostSharp, that was still open source at the point. It was not enough, so um, it, it became commercial. So now this is a commercial product. Uh, I will more talk about the, uh, the vision behind that and, uh, um, and aspect-oriented programming, very little actually, but, but more about like a conceptual talk <laughs> than a product demo. Um, and because it is conceptual, we are not going to talk just about concepts. We are about to conceptualize conceptualizing Okay, when we talk about patterns, we are talking about the way we are thinking, reasoning, and, and this is why I have this pipe here, because I'm Belgian and this pipe is famous. It is from a Belgian painter, René Magritte, and it is written, "Ceci n'est pas une pipe," which means, "This is not a pipe." Okay, this is not a pipe. So let's think about the process, how we are thinking. Uh, <coughs> it's going to be very intellectual. So, okay, many customers of PostShare, but we will skip that. I will start with um, a language of patterns. So let's talk about design patterns, but from a cognitive point of view, not from a, a programming point of view, but cognitive. Then I will go in the second section about uh, the fact that there is no pattern keyword in C-sharp. And so what is the impact? What can we do with that? I will say just a few words about aspect-oriented programming, uh, but I will uh, position it in the frame of this pattern automation. And then we will start something specific to PostSharp. At this point, you all get a free license, okay? So before it's all technology independent, then it becomes PostSharp specific, so you all get a free license. I will display the URL exactly here. And then there will be a case study. So I will try to show how we can implement the vision concept, the philosophy of the first section, uh, implement it using PostSharp. Ready? OK, let's go. A language of patterns. So you know this book. OK, this is uh, a part of our training education or culture, I would even say, or religion. Uh, it, this, this book has a spe special status. It is, it is a kind of sacred. Um, and it's important. It's important to read it, even if it's pretty old now, but 
you know, it, it is, this is a part of our profession. But I think that too often we stop at this book, that we, we stop thinking about patterns, or when we think about patterns, we, we think about books. So we have books about patterns. And what I want to, to say today is that patterns are not just things you find in books. It is a way of thinking about software. And if you have a pattern and it is not in a book, it is still a pattern. And you can still apply the same approach, the same thinking. So the source of inspiration of, a, of the Gang of Four, it was 18 years before the Gang of Four wrote this book. This was Christopher Alexander, uh, an American archi uh, architect. And he was wondering, he worked on this question during many decades. He wrote a lot of books about patterns. And he was wondering, how is it possible that any simple farmer could make a house a thousand times more beautiful than all the struggling architects of the last 50 years could do. Should put that in the context of the 70s uh, and architecture, uh, modern architecture, destroyed uh, a lot of Western capitals and towns. One, the typical example is Brussels, my home capital. Complete districts were destroyed in the name of modernism and new buildings. And the architects were, were wondering, how is it possible that we realize, implement something so, so ugly? And he started thinking about uh, how communities, how societies um, accumulate experience with art. And he came with this concept of pattern. So I took this illustration. This is a village in uh, Czech Republic. It is called Holashovice. And you see this is beautiful folk, folk architecture that Christopher Alexander had in mind. And it is beautiful. This is UNESCO protected. And uh, you can see a few patterns, like the shape of the roof, the number of windows at each floor the shape of the gates, the colors, you see many patterns. So let's dive a little in the thinking and the reasoning of Christopher Alexander. And he says, we live in a world of patterns. And patterns are everywhere around us. And to have a pattern, you need regularity. So here, the pattern is ways in the sand. This is an example that, uh, <coughs> that Alexander gives. Um, and to have waves in the sand, what do you need? You need a system with a few elements. So what is one thing you need to do? You need to have to have waves in the sand. So you need sand, OK. So some solid matter with some <coughs> granularity. It doesn't work with mud. Does it work with mud? So, and you need something else. If you do that in the ISS, will you get waves in the sand? Gravity. You need gravity. And so when you have these three elements, the wind takes uh, a grain of sand, the, and gravity brings it back. And this system of forces create patterns. But this is important for architecture, less for us probably, but uh, he says there is Regularity is not identity. So you are not building architecture out of repeatable units that you just assemble. Because it, this was an attempt of the, the architecture of the 60s and 70s to, to do architecture based on repeatable, not patterns, but say units that you just put behind. And you create an array of, say, flats just by assembling. So this was a positioning against that. But let's keep that. And just consider the other thing, the complement. And this is variety. So here is a pattern in mac macrobiology. And we pretend there, is no, there are no uh, single pair of human beings that are exactly the same. And let's take now like another step in the philosophy of, computer, of programming languages. But I pretend this 
couple here, regularity variety, is essential to the way that programming languages are designed. So if we take the first programming language, programming language that was designed for humans and not for machines, so not assembly language, which is done for machines. Um, so the first language was Fortran. And there was Fortran 1 that had basically the variables um, and instructions. But then the first feature they introduced after that was procedure. And it became procedural programming. So how do we encapsulate regularity in procedural programming? And the answer is in the question. In procedural programming, how do we implement procedure? Uh, procedures. Procedures. I tell you, yeah, how do we implement regularity? Yeah. When we have repetition, we do a procedure. How do we inject variety into that procedure? Variables, Variables in Fortran 1 or 2, and then parameters. But you are right, in the first version of Fortran that supported procedures, there were no parameters. So this was through variables. And then we had to wait. Well, they, they were parameters later, but the first language that had what we call the stack, it was Lisp. Uh, and then you had local scopes, because previously everything was passed through global variables, actually. There was no local. Local scope. So, okay, object oriented programming. How do we in encapsulate regularity in object oriented programming? Object. An object. Okay. How do we add variety? Hmm? Parameters. Well, parameters, it is still the old paradigm, so there is no a new, a new way. Classes. Well, classes and objects, this is the same, but I would say in, uh, inheritance. Inheritance and overwriting a method. When you have a virtual method, you have the regular thing. But then you give the ability to overwrite a method. OK, last example, functional programming. How do you encapsulate regularity with functional programming? Function, OK, or high order function. And variety is a function passed as a parameter. So philosophically, this is actually very important to programming languages, this, this thing. Uh, and I would like today to think at this level. Because if we, you know, when we code, we solve te technical problems. But there is one problem we do not solve, is how programming languages will, will look like in 50 years from now. If we want to solve the problem of how do we want programming languages to be, we need to think at this level. So let's continue with philosophy. So. Uh, um, yeah, every pattern is uh, a resolution for a system of forces. This is something that was very well described by the Gang of Four. Um, and in the context of design patterns, the system of forces are the constraints, the objective, um, the resource constraints you have. So this, this is well defined. Uh, for Christopher Alexander, patterns are everywhere. Uh, here I give the symbol of, uh, well, the capital of the symbol of representative democracy. We could say this is a, this is a, um, a pattern of social organization. Patterns are self-sustainable. This is more important for architecture, but somehow also for computing. If you all do the same way in your company, you, you all follow the same way, and then the boss leaves, and suddenly you say, ah. Let's do the, like, the right way now. So you had the pattern, but the pattern was not self-sustainable. It was imposed, top down. And this is not how uh, patterns survive and repeat themselves, reproduce themselves, or just how the building gets maintained over the centuries. And this is my last point, and it is very important for us. Um, patterns form a language. And a part of learning any profession, like carpentry here, is to learn every of these patterns and, lo and learn how, how they interact. And all these patterns have a name that I would not know in non-language anyway. 
And uh, so these these are these are ideas that the the gang of four took from this book and they apply it to computer science. Now to answer the question of Christopher Alexander, so he he gives an answer. So how how is it possible that that farmers could build such beautiful barns? And he answers because they build it themselves. They lived in the house built probably by the, their, their parents or ancestors. And when they did another one, they knew the defects of the previous one and they did incremental changes. And the pattern improves over time. And he says the reason why um, architecture started to, to uh, produce ugly things and dysfunctional things is that well, architects no longer lived in what they built. They are like IT consultants. They, you build a project, put it, that in production, and then you move to the next thing. And you never see how what you wrote behave in real, in, yes, in real life. So you, you are missing a chance of self-improvement. That's one thing. And then also, so there is one thing. Uh, the way that architects were trained was different. It was academic and not um, learn on the spot like apprenticeship. And the third one, there were new materials like concrete, uh, steel, glass. It's like we also have new technologies. You know, what a beautiful stack we had with XML. What do we, you know, we had XSD, we had soap. And then someone said, yeah, let's do everything in JSON. Like year one, let's do JSON. JSON is fantastic. And then after, so after three years, you get, well, let's implement schemas for JSON. And here we are, you know, XML schema. So every generation needs to reinvent everything and this actually uh, breaks the cycle of improvement. So patterns are essential to the way humans communicate, reason, improve their traits. When we have a pattern, we give it a name. And patterns belong to the people. They don't belong to books. So it's OK if you have a pattern inside your company, you give it a name. And don't be impressed if someone tell, well, it is not in the Gang of Four book. And yeah, it is not there. You know, their job was not to define like, what would you know, the, the whole universe. It was just to introduce a very useful work uh, of Christopher Alexander to our, to our industry. OK, and now I will attack another myth of many developers, maybe of our, our whole community. The myth says that uh, programming is a mathematical activity, or it is playing, it is something technical. And I would like to take another point of view here. And so what do you believe is the most limiting factor when we program? When we program, say, like business applications, what is the scar resource, scarce resource we need to, to cope with? Excuse me? Lack of requirements. Lack of requirements. <laughs> OK, <laughs> time. The time of what? Time of who? Time of the day, OK. Well, I, that's, I like this answer. I believe what, what is scarce is human intelligence. But because first, you can, you can only hire people that are on the job market. You, you as a company, are only able to attract uh, a limited number of these talented people available. Even these talented people, I'm sorry, have limited intelligence. Okay, nobody hasn't has unlimited intelligence. When you have this intelligence, what do you want this person to do with that? Do do you want uh, your most talented engineers to do malloc and free? No, or do you want to give them? Uh, a language that allocates memory so they can focus their energy on something that has a, a, a competitive benefit for your company, for instance. Okay, so for me, 
programming is a human activity. When, when we are programming, and especially when we are in a, uh, in a senior position, maybe senior developer, it may be architect, our role in this position is actually not to write code. Our role is to make sure the rest of the team is productive and to, to, to make the rest of the team productive, you need this point of view that programming is a human activity and that the real limiting factor is intelligence. And you know, stop blaming your colleagues or HR, but just say, okay, we need to do that with the people we have, so let's do things simpler. So, I've been working with this philosophy for many years now. I've, I've designed APIs used by thousands of people for 14 years. I did, so I need to maintain these APIs and make, to maintain backward compatibility and so on. So there are a few principles that I like to, to apply. If an API is a user interface, but it's a user interface for other developers, and developers are human beings. So all you know about user experience, it's also valid with APIs, and you need to, to pay attention to the way that your API will be consumed. So if your API solves the problem, it should be in the terms, it should be explained and exposed in the terms of the, the consumer of the problem and not how the problem is solved, not the implementation. This is the gap between the implementation and the problem solved is the, the abstraction. If there is no abstraction, your API has no value. So this is a UI for developer, take the same um, the same um, state of mind. An API is a language extension. Specifically, this is an extension of C Sharp. If you design an API for C Sharp 1, it will be very different than for C Sharp 7.3. Even with small language increments, you will find that the API is better expressed a bit differently. But a language extension also means that people will start talking to each other using the terms of your API. <coughs> so your API creates a vocabulary, it creates a grammar, how these concepts go together. So it's useful to use, to use analogies. <coughs> For instance, if you designed an Android system, as, as I did, I figured out it was good to have a concept of a recorder, because it's easy to say this object is recordable, and, and it records itself into this recorder. The choice of names is arbitrary, but find something that makes sense from a cognitive point of view so people can talk about that and you can explain that easily. Use relevant level of abstraction. Don't ask people to do low level memory management if you are doing, um, I don't know, uh, UI applications, for instance. Um, also important is humans will do errors, all will do, and uh, you need to cope with that. So when you write the API, you should wonder what is the desired behavior in case of error of the, of the developer. One example was, uh, comes to my mind just now, but um, there were a lot of bugs, of buff bugs with buffer overruns because the first versions of all these APIs with strings uh, had no length, par length parameter. It was supposed that the string was zero terminated. And there were a lot of bugs and security holes because of that. And so the next generation of APIs had um, a new parameter with the, the capacity of the buffer. Um, or another, another example, well, I will give it in, in the second part. Um, but if you are doing, for instance, multi-threading, what is the, the best option if a developer, say, forgets to take a lock? Is the best option to have a random data ray that appears with one chance on a million, or is it better to have a deterministic exception that they can fix immediately? You decide. 
But that's an important point when designing for other people in, is to realize they are going to make mistakes. And additionally, for our own company, when they will have problems, they will call us. And they call for free, but we do not provide support for free. I mean, we have cost in providing support. It's, so it is in our interest to make sure that the errors are, are, are discovered soon. It is easy to diagnose and so on. So, and then maybe the most important thing, if you want to remember just one thing, it is iterate the name code document cycle at least twice. So normally, when you start coding, you don't know yet what you will end up with, unless you are coding based on a specification. But if, if you are coding, you know, like um, developer without specification, you would figure out some name. Say, OK, set items. And then you implement thing, you code, and then if you write for other, you need to write an example of how the code is supposed to be used, and then to document. And when you document, you say the set items method adds the adds the items to the list, and then you say, well, wait. If the method adds the item to the list, it is not get items, but it's for, it's for instance populate list. And you change the name. And it's important to do that before you release the RTM of your API, because if you are well mannered with APIs, you are not going to have breaking changes in small minor releases. So I take honor in documenting all the APIs that we write as a team. I actually want to document them to make sure I understand them and I can rename. And I would never publish a non-documented API just for this. OK, so let's be a bit redundant. Back to Che Guevara. So if it is repetitive, it deserves to be treated as a pattern. OK, there is no, uh, it doesn't need to be described in the book. Patterns build languages. Languages enable cognition, communication, reasoning. Programming is a human activity. So that means programming is about talking to colleagues. Writing code is not only writing something that is executable, but writing something that another colleague will read, maybe will need to understand 20 years from now. So it is not principally a mathematical abstraction. And designing a framework, an API, an architecture is to design for humans. You know, the machine really does not care. The machine would execute anything. Um, but your fellow developers, especially those who will, whom you will not know because they will come after you will leave, they will appreciate a well-designed framework architecture. And so now we take it for granted that we think with patterns. I've taken all this time to just tell you that. But the problem is that we don't have a pattern keyword. So the languages we are building with you know, force us to implement manually the patterns. So we have a pattern about how to implement notify property change. We know how to do that. But the compiler does cannot do that. So actually, we are building everything with bricks and mortar instead of having bigger bricks. And the result of that is boilerplate code that if you know it from all these features, like notify property change, under redo code, contracts, logging, transaction handling, exception handling, multi-threading, security, audit, caching, you could find other. These are the most typical. So. The idea is that you have a design pattern. Design means that you know how to write your code, but you still need to write it. So there is an abstraction gap between the reasoning of software developers and the language. That's typically what you get. This is not typical. No, this is exaggerated. Green is, green is the nice code. You don't need to read everything. Just look at the colors. This is the, the useful code, and then you have the boilerplate for transaction handling and so on. This is not typical, typical. Based on our CIP data, uh, or the top quartile of our customers, um, say 15%. So 15% can be removed. And this is, this is top quartile. It is not up to 15%. Some do much more. 
and some do much less, and I wonder why they are using our product, but you can do that. Okay, so the consequences, we'll go through that in a minute. No, no. So it, it takes time and effort to build. There are pro like quality issues. It makes the software less maintainable and more difficult to understand for new developers on the team. So the question you want to solve is, is how to add support to patterns. But we don't want to switch to a new language. Because did you notice how, when there is a, a cool pattern, sometimes someone creates a new language based on the pattern. Like a very cool pattern is the actor programming model. Very cool pattern. Uh, that's, and, and you know one language that was built for the actor pattern? That's what it is. Erlang. Erlang. Extremely useful pattern is immutable. And functional programming is basically built on this pattern. So we don't want uh, to have one new language for each pattern. What, what I propose is a way to extend languages with your own patterns. So maybe you could buy patterns like now you buy components from different companies like Telerik, Syncfusion, you know, there are all these all these vendors of UI components, and you may buy a notify property change aspect from, of course, PostSharp, another well, aspect from another company. Supposing that all that that uh, like the industry would converge on that, so that's what we are working on. So, so instead of bricks and mortar, now you get your panel pre-made. Okay, so what we are doing is basically to outsource the repetitive work to compilers so you get more powerful tools. So managers are happy because less cost and developers are happy because the work that remains is much more interesting. And developers are never out of work anyway. So that was the easy part to see, but um, the, there is a big impact on, on reliability because many features that make the difference between a prototype and a, um, and a production-ready app. These are these features that require boilerplate, like logging, transaction handling, uh, security, caching, and so on. So when you don't have the right tool to do that, you do it manually. It is not tested properly. Who tests logging? You, know? you do copy-paste of logging, but then you, add, you forget to add a parameter. So many problems with, with implementing patterns manually. Uh, also, your code is cleaner, easier to understand, easier to change. If you, if you want to change your pattern, you change it once and not in every implementation. And also, what's reported by customers is that it is easier for new team members to get started because they don't need to learn all the technical code. So. End of words, now I will show you how it looks like when you have a compiler that understands one pattern, and I will just show you with Notify property change. And then in the second part, I will show you how to do that yourself. So I will switch here to this app. And I have a... Um, a simple application, very simple, WPF based. I have two entities. First name, last name, but if I change things here, this is a composite field. It is, and it does not get updated, and this is because um, notify property change is not implemented. So let's think about notify property change as, as, a, as a pattern. So could you explain how to implement notify property change? Would, would someone try? Like ex explain to one colleague how to implement notify property change. No volunteer? That's fine. So, so if you want to do that properly, you need to look at property getters. And then you follow, uh, I, will, I, will, I will take a, uh, an easier case because this one is difficult. Okay, so I follow property getters 
and I look at all code references. And here I see there is a code reference, a string builder, I don't understand, but so I go further and I, I find a reference to line one. And this is a property getter. So now I found, a, so I found a reference to line one, line two. So actually now I'm making a map between properties or fields. Well, say fields because actually eventually this is mapped to a field. So we make a, a map between property getters and fields. And now we go in all methods that modify these fields and we raise the notification for all affected properties. So the algorithm is look at property getters, you, you walk the, the whole call tree, and uh, you create this map, then you take the, the inverse map and you go to field, to, to fields and you, you raise notifications. So this is an algorithm and you are, if you are doing notify property change, you are doing this algorithm manually. Okay, so, but the compiler can do that too. So let's do how it is done with spell sharp when it's all ready made for you. So you call the code action. Is it okay from the bottom? No. Okay. Oh, no. So I call the code action and the, the first thing it will, so I choose implement notify property change. Actually it's going just to do two things. One is to install a new get package and the second is to add a custom attribute. So I'm talking of a compiler that is smarter. It is not a code generator. Code generators create code that you need to maintain. So for instance, ReSharper is able to implement notify property change. But then you need to maintain the implementation. When you add a field or, or a property or change the code, you will need to, to change it. So here the compiler does that. So it is always synchronized with your source code because there is nothing else than your source code. Okay, so I add it on the, on the view model. I add it on the base class of my model. Now I can run that, build that. And this time it takes a little more time because PostSharp does more work or it starts doing work, it didn't do anything. And now I can start writing and you see this field gets updated as I'm, well not as I'm writing, but as the, the binding commits the change to the, to the target property. Okay, so, and this is still my business code and I have a dependency on the property of a property of a property and this property is actually composed of, I compute it from many properties and this works. The, the business code remains the business code. The compiler did all the work and if you go um, here to the tooltip, you see that PostSharp post analyze the code and says that a, a change in line one possibly affects full address. And here is the symmetric thing. Full, the full address property depends on line one, line two, town and country. So you get an idea of how so what PostSharp understood from that. And here the same thing, you see that full name, yes, full, the full name property depends on customer, customer.first name, customer.last name. And so PostSharp knows that it, it needs also to instrument changes to customer and to, to subscribe to changes in, child, in children objects and so on. So, I don't want to focus this on notify property change, but this is the feeling you could get when the compiler understands the pattern. Question before we go to how we do that. It's good because it's not a good time to have question. Okay, so aspect oriented programming, how does it, how does it uh, fit in this frame? Because after all, PostSharp started as an aspect-oriented programming framework. Mm -hmm. So, the goal is to automate the implementation or the validation of, 
of design patterns. Let's start with what I did not say yet, and this is uh, analysis. They are patterns that you have in your code, or you want to have them in your code, but they cannot be automated. A typical example is when you write, say, a large business application, and you have a concept of a business rule. And maybe your business departments, they invent new business rules every quarter, every week, to test new things. So you want it to be a pluggable concept. So as a member of the architecture team, you may say, well, business rules are going to be pluggable through, say, MEF, if it is your dependency injection framework. So these are going to be MEF components. But actually, business rules, I want to have one instance of business rule per document to validate. So I need a factory. And the real MEF component is going to be the factory. So I want each business, business rule to have a, a nested class named factory. The, the factory class is going to have an export custom attribute um, for MEF. And additionally, the business rule class is going to be named business rule or something business rule. So I have a set of conventions, and I would like my whole team to follow this. And the best is when I don't need to enforce that during code reviews. But developers have immediately an error if they try to compile something that does not comp comply with the rules. So in this case, you have a pattern, something that you want to enforce. Uh, and actually, you really want to say no to creativity here. And it's sometimes good for business. So, and this is enforced by static analysis. I guess you know a few tools that can do that. Roslyn validators, no, Roslyn analyzers. Um, FXCOP was one of these tools. You have a commercial tool, NDepend. Um, and PulseSharp has also a framework for that. But this, this is not our main focus. But static, static analysis is important when you think in terms of patterns and you want to enforce patterns. Now, there are patterns that we are not able to fully analyze statically. For instance, we have a immutable pattern. Immutable means that you cannot modify the state of the object, not the object, the state of the entity. You could have children to a child state of the object that is also immutable. OK, and so this is not easy to enforce that statically by static analysis. For instance, if the constructor is allowed to call delegates or static me or virtual methods, it would take hours days to analyze the whole code graph and so on. So for this, we use dynamic analysis, which is already code generation. So and for code generation, aspect-oriented programming is a very interesting technology. This is what PostStrap started with before I realized that there was more. So. Now let's switch to the way of thinking of aspect-oriented programming. So separation of concerns is what we want. When we write code, we want things to be nicely separated in assemblies, namespaces, classes. A nice separation of concern, this is what we want. This is the property of the solution domain of C-sharp. It is not the real world. So in the real world, things are not nicely separated. But concerns are cross-cutting. And so this is the jargon of AOP. It says about itself that AOP uh, addresses the problem of cross-cutting concerns. So for instance, transaction management cross-cuts customer management and order management. That would be an example. So aspect-oriented programming solves this gap. And they take this approach to um, to explain it, which I believe is, is uh, poorer, I mean less rich intellectually than the, than the design pattern approach. But actually, this was done in parallel at about the same time uh, in the early 90s. So this is aspect-oriented programming. And to, to achieve that, to bridge this gap, 
uh, aspect-oriented programming first defines what, what is an aspect. So an aspect is uh, a collection of transformation. So if you want to implement, say, transaction handling, first you would describe this to, to, to a colleague or to a rubber duck, and you say, rubber duck, to implement transaction handling, you will add a try catch to the method, and before the try, you would open the transaction scope. When inside the catch, you would roll back, and when it succeeds, you will, you will commit. OK? So then, actually, what you did, you, you can tell it to the compiler. You just described a, a, a transformation of code. So this is an aspect. The second thing is that you apply the aspect to, to code. So the aspect with both sharp is a custom attribute. In the beginning of AOP in Java, there were no custom attributes, so it, they were described in separate files. Um, the key point is that aspects don't know too much about the target code, and the target code doesn't know too much about aspects. And therefore, there is a separation between the target code and the aspects. And this is, this is the way it should be done. I've, I've seen some customers uh, creating, for instance, one specific aspect for, for, for every single method, and that's, that's not why this was designed. It was designed to separate the concerns between business code and target code. So there is this concept of, of realness between the aspects and business code. So AOP in .NET. So, PostSharp has been there since, since actually not the beginning, but uh, since 14 years. There were frameworks before PostSharp, but they did not survive generics. They were written for .NET 1, and generics were very difficult to implement. So they, no framework survived generics, and I wrote PostSharp directly with generics, so I was lucky enough. So there are many PostSharp clones, some, some projects even named themselves PostSharp clones. Um, I don't think there is one really maintained now. Quite often, their maintainer works during one, two years, and then it stops. But there are two uh, solutions that you can use and are stable. Uh, a good idea to use them, actually. These are the ASP.NET action filters. So you have, you, you know, this thing that you can add custom attributes to your controller or to your web API, and um, the custom attributes implement some behavior. Or you can add, uh, you can use dynamic proxies in dependency injection framework. So dynamic proxies, they get between the consumer of your code and the implementation. So when you ask the, the dependency injection framework, for an implementation of the service. It will generate a class dynamically using system reflection emit. And this class would implement the interface, but it would call, um, typically it calls a, a chain of responsibility so you can plug aspects. So and I, I think all frameworks can do that. So the difference between PostSharp and the rest is that uh, with PostSharp, you can add aspects to all, all methods. With the alternatives, you can add aspects only to, to the interface of your component, which is, this is already a, an, an important uh, thing to do. Let's continue. So aspect-oriented programming with PostSharp. So after all, PostSharp is at the base an aspect-oriented framework. It's AOP is the technology. Pattern automation is the vision. So. Did I tell you that? We are based in Prague. I, I came from Prague, I'm Belgium. I told you that we are seven employees. That's four, four full-time developers, five nationalities. We have no salespeople. It's just me here trying to convince everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, we are, we are just doing PostSharp. This is no consulting or no services, just licenses. So no, technically. Post sharp, this is the map. So don't worry about the SDK. You are not supposed to use that. Maybe you would like to use that, but that's the low level stuff. 
it's very difficult. It takes months to train someone on that. But for customers, we have the framework. And we have two frameworks. The difference is a bit artificial. But the aspect framework is to, uh, to modify your code. And inside this framework, you have aspect primitives. These are the basic bricks from which you will build transformations. You have, um, then you have a way to, to use many bricks to do more complex transformations. Just, not just one transformation, but two or three, uh, even more. The architecture framework is to validate the code, but validating the code is basically just analyzing plus writing a message. So uh, writing a message is, is, is simple, and uh, so you, you get the tools to, to analyze your code. Uh, I will show very little of this. And based on these frameworks, we have libraries of ready-made aspects that implement well-known patterns some in books, some not in books. Um, logging, notify property change is the, the thing I have shown before. Dependency properties, attach properties, code contracts, commands we do, which is not written there. So this is for example, for trading, we have trading models, like immutable, freezable, synchronized, read and write or synchronized, thread define, deadlock detection, thread dispatching. Then we have caching and we have parent-child visitor because it's useful for trading and for underredo. Where is it? There is one redo. We have underredo also. So so this is this is post sharp. So you got the license for everything. Uh, and today I will talk about the aspect framework only. So what are the aspect primitives? What basically the the, the the transformations, the abstract transformation that you would get started, the small Lego bricks. So on metas, you can add a try catch finally, or you can add an interceptor between the caller and the implementation. On fields and properties, you can intercept them and you can validate them with parameters. You can do validation only. You cannot intercept a parameter. On events, you can intercept adding, removing, firing an event on time, you can introduce an interface, introduce a member, execute code when the class is fully initialized. You can also add a managed resource to the assembly and you can add custom attributes to anything. So these are the basic transformations. There are a few different things, but this is really the, the most important. And based on that, you will do real aspects. So, Let's start with the easiest aspect. This is on method boundary, which adds try catch finally. So your aspect class with on method boundary, it has these four methods called advices. These methods are virtual. They have an empty implementation by default. And when you add an, as an on method boundary aspect to method, postchar will add a try catch finally to your method and call your advices, your aspects. A good example is logging. It's such a good example that all speakers about AOP take this example. They have done that for 20 years. And most people believe that post sharp is just for logging. So it's not true. But I accepted my fate five years ago. And I was pissed off. You know, I spent so many years, I mean, just for logging. So I thought, OK, you want me to do logging? OK, I will do logging. And then I started to do logging properly. And if you have time, I can show you after the presentation what is logging when I spend a few months on that problem. So this logging is just as a demo. It is not real logging. It's, it's hello world of aspect-oriented programming. So I'm going to my sample project. All samples can be found on samples.postsharp.net. And there is a link to GitHub. So I'm going to show here logging example. You can see that on GitHub. Download everything. 
And so I will switch to Visual Studio uh, for serve samples. Custom logging is here. And show you your first aspect, logging a method call. So you derive a class from on method boundary aspect, and this class inherits from attribute. So your aspect is also a custom attribute. And here are the method, the advices that I can implement. So here is on entry, this is before execution, on success is on success, on exception is on exception, and on exit is finally. And I don't need it here. So here, this parameter contains your context. It's a bit clearer on, on success. Because you can see that I have the method and I can choose if the method is a constructor, if it's not a constructor, and the return type is not void, then I'm also going to log the return value, which is also in the context. So you have the method info or method base or constructor info. That's, yeah, method info or constructor info is here. Um, you have the return type, you have the exception when it is an exception, it is here, and you have the arguments at any time. Here, where is that? Yeah, here you have the arguments, which is something like a tuple, so you can, you can iterate through the arguments. So, you put a parenthesis, we go through everything and we append each argument to the string builder. So this is the aspect, but remember there are two things, you need to create the aspect but then you need to apply it to something and here, what did I do? Oh, I will undo that, I did that at a previous demo today, let me undo that, okay, so I apply this to everything, to the whole assembly, and then I remove, you see I'm, I'm excluding that from the aspect namespace because if I add logging to logging, I'm just doing nothing else than logging until my computer comes out of power or disk space, probably. Anyway, so I call that multicasting because when you add to an assembly, it's going to add to anything inside, all fields, uh, no, all methods, because this is a method level aspect. But then you, you can control it and you, and, and you can say, I don't want this namespace, or I want only public methods, or I want only public types. We can use naming conventions. So there are these two things. I have the aspect, I add the aspect to everything, even property getters, which is terrible. You should not do that in production, really, don't add logging to property getters. And here is my Fibonacci example. You see I have the, the, the method name, type name, dot method name, uh, with the parameter values and the return value. What else could we expect from that code? Uh, you see in IntelliSense here that log method is applied here, so even if you don't see the custom attribute here, you can still understand that this method is being logged because of IntelliSense. So, interesting to make the distinction between the method and the method body. Method body are the instructions of the method. So, when you add an aspect, an interception aspect to that method, it has one advice on invo, which is the interceptor method. And then the advice can do stuff, so do a cache lookup or call dispatcher.begin. And then it calls proceed, and proceed actually calls the method being intercepted. So how can the aspect know which method needs to be invoked? Actually, we now need to expose that method under, under an interface. So we create this binding class which implements the interface I method binding and we replace your original method by a call to the aspect to the context we give a pointer a reference to this singleton binding class 
And now the interceptor can call the original method or the next aspect because it creates a chain of responsibility to invoke your method. So this affects the stack. If you have, if you have an interception on Fibonacci, you would have one, asp one or many call, uh, stack frames for every single method call. And a good example is auto retry. Auto retry. That's a wonderful example. No, we are in this company, Automaker. Now we have auto retry. <laughs> okay, well, I shouldn't. Let me start with showing the aspect. Auto retry. So this time we inherit from method interception aspect, and it has this method on invoke. Let me st start with the synchronous implementation on invoke. And this is the call to proceed to, to intercept, to, no, to call the intercepted method. And we have the for loop. So now I, I will step into, step into everything. So I call download file and I'm directly inside the aspect here. Okay, when I call proceed, and here this is the non prettified stack, so this is how actually what gets, what gets executed. So to answer your question, I will go back to zoom mode, show the stack. So you see here, this is download file. This is the original method, and you see now it is gray because actually your method no longer contains your code, but it contains compiler generate code on invoke is your aspect code and you call proceed and proceed calls the binding class which eventually calls your original method body. Now when you enable call stack cleaning, it looks better. Uh, but this is what actually gets executed. Did it answer your question? Yes. Okay. So let's continue. I'm writing a message, no need to step into that. Uh, downloading, okay, I should do a few errors. We are lucky today, wow. You know, because I guess in Cambridge, the first time there was an error. No, but there was no network connection. <laughs> well, sorry guys, it was successful. <clears throat> it was successful, so we hit here, return directly. So let's do another attempt. And uh, I will see if I will st still be lucky, I will go to casino today. Oh no, uh, no casino for today. So network failure. Ah. Okay, you know, I'm back inside the aspect. You have the exception handler. I decide if I can do retry. Some customers do pretty advanced stuff there. They look at the SQL exception dot SQL code. They look which SQL codes are worth being retried. Uh, so you you can do uh, intelligent stuff here. So you see here actually aspect oriented programming. This this is object oriented programming. But the difference is that we. We, we use technology to automatically bind or inject this behavior into your business code. This is done at compile time, and uh, this is why your business code remains simple. You don't have the auto retry in, in not here. No, not here. You don't have the, the auto retry logic here. It's all here. So a good thing to know is that when you are using method level aspects, we understand async. So if you use a, on entry on success, on success is actually when the async method is successful and not when the kickoff method is successful, which is always successful. Um, and with auto retry, you have another over, uh, overload 
with method interception, you can implement on invoke async, which is then an async method, and then you call await proceed async. So when you do caching for an async method, you would have both implementations. You would have the implementation for classic methods and for async methods. So welcome to doing everything twice. That's the life after async. <coughs> so the same thing for location interception aspect. Um, we create a binding class. It has two semantics, not one like in methods, but you have two semantics, one for get, one for set. We use that for fields and properties, and there is one missing property for fields. Who gets that? Who will find the missing property for field? There is get, set, and there is a third one that we don't support. Please? Let? Let? No. no. In C sharp, it's ref. Yeah. Loading the address. L-D-F-L-A in MSIL. So loading the address is not supported. When you load the address on the, uh, of a field, we are lost. We, we don't know. We, so you can assign it to everything and to, to anything and skip the aspect pipeline. Um, so get and set. <coughs> and I have a very quick example here, and it is to normalize a string because often users are very undisciplined and they put spaces before and after and sometimes even worse things uh, I need this and so I would like to trim the string whenever it is uh, assigned to my field so this is simple you do a location interception aspect and you implement on set value, and then you cast the string to you cast the value to a stream. You trim it. You lowercase it. You normalize it, interline whatever you want, and then you call proceed set value, which calls the next node in the chain of responsibility of assigning the field. And guess what? It works only with strings, and this is important. And remember the first part of the presentation when I was trying to be intellectual and philosophical about language. So we have a new element in the language, normalized string attribute, and it works only on, on strings. So it has a grammar, a context in which it is valid. Still, it's still simple, but, but the code to enforce that is, is simple too. So when you have some assumption about the target code, it is much better, rather than to let the, this result into a cast exception, it's much better to implement compile time validate and to check at compile time that the type of the field or property is indeed a string. Otherwise, I will write an error message where the, line, the, the file in line is the same as location info this is a severity, the, the code of the message and the, the text. How do we apply aspects to code? I've shown two ways already, and one is uh, multicasting. This is a declarative way. You add the custom attribute to your, to your code, to assembly. You can add it to an XML file. It's, it works exactly the same way. And then you filter by naming conventions. You filter or namespace or... or you filter by modifier, like public, private, protected, virtual, abstract, non-abstract, probably. Uh, you say that it's valid only on, on fields or only on properties or both. So this is multicasting. That's one way. The first way, but the zeroth way is to add directly to the method or field where you need the behavior. Sometimes you need to multicast, like logging is a typical example. Some, Sometimes you need to be picky and pick one by one. Auto retry may be a good example of something that you don't want to apply to all your methods. So another tool you have is aspect inheritance. So you add it to the base class. Remember how I added notify property change to my base model class. So typically, when you want notify property change for one class, you want it for all derived classes. So we have aspect inheritance too. I will skip that because I've done that. 
And then you have aspect provider, and this is very, very powerful because it allows you to analyze your code from within the compiler, within PostSharp here. You have access to your code by a reflection. So this is the target where of the custom attribute where it was applied. And so in this case, I cast to a I cast it to a type, and then I can go a query over reflection. Filter methods, look for specific custom attributes, look for, for more difficult properties, um, whatever is needed for your case. And then eventually, you return a set of aspect instances, which tells, I want the check license aspect to all methods that have this obfuscation custom attribute, for instance. Um, very powerful, and it also allows you to add a layer of abstraction between your API and your implementation. I will show you that in a minute. So these are, and it is very quick. You now this, this is just to give you an idea of what you can do with PostSharp. Um, now you you can use these concepts to build language extensions. And here I'm switching between technical view and no, I'm, I'm back to a more cognitive view. So let's take serialization, for instance. We, we know serialization since .NET 1.0. You have the seriali serializable attribute, and you have non-serialized attribute. So this is a kind of an extension of the language. Actually, in, in C Sharp, it is not a custom attribute. This is a, a well-known attribute. It, it does not compile into a custom attribute, but to a flag of the CLR. So this is really a language extension. The same with XML serializer. We have another set of custom attributes. Um, now, we can build sub-languages, like for caching. We can have a custom attribute that adds caching. Then you will have a, a custom attribute that configures caching, a custom attribute that invalidates caching for another method. So you have a family of custom attributes. These are the nouns. Then, then there is grammar between them, how they relate to each other. How do you make sure when you have an invalidate custom attribute that it invalidates something meaningful? You will need to validate that it invalidates something that is cached. So this thing, actually, you, have, you are introducing new things in the language. and. It has a grammar, and you need to validate at build time if these attributes are used properly together. So we have that also for trading models. You can mark a class as immutable, as freezable. You can mark a, a collection as a child, which means that it will be affected by the same trading model as the parent class, and so on. So um, it's not just about how we do stuff about technology, but it is about the language we are creating and uh, the, the way people are going to use that. Um, and I will take one case study. It is, it is a good example. It's, it's, it's pretty simple, but you see that it gets complex actually very quickly. Authorization. Um, let's take a... a uh, a typical uh, authorization framework um, that you find that in your, not on your file system completely, but in CRM systems and in many business systems. The job of security is divided between three, say, roles, but not in this meaning. Three responsibilities, say, yeah, three responsible people. Developers on don't know who will be allowed to do stuff, but they say to read that field, you need the read permission. But to read this other field, employee salary, you need read personal info permission. So this is a developer responsibility. Then the administrator tells um, all managers of an employee have access or have this specific permission, read personal information. Um, also, the trading model needs to 
on the threading model. The object model needs to implement this concept that the, the employee is an employee of a, of a business entity and the business entity has managers. But this is object oriented thing. Okay, and then, so the administrator assigns permissions to roles and then when users use the system, um, people actually subject become roles. So for instance, when you add a manager to an entity, uh, this is not an administration action, this is a user action. Is it clear? I feel that it's, I'm a bit confused with that. That's a typical for a CRM where the, 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 the responsibilities are split in three roles. So, and this is actually pretty, pretty complex. Um, so what is the challenge here for today is how to make it easy for the developer and safe in case of error. So what, what do we want in case of error? Remember that we are human. And in case we forget, or in case developers forget to require a permission, we want at least one permission by default. If we read a field, we want the read permission by default to be required. And if we write a field by default, we want the write permission. So let's say this is the convention we are taking. You, you can take another decision, it's, but it is just to, to exemplify the process of thinking here. So what would be the permission API? We need something to apply permission by default to the whole object structure when they can be hundreds of entities. Um, so that's the, the default permission. And then we need a mechanism to override permissions. And I would like to have one custom attribute requires permission. And this custom attribute would be valid on fields, on properties, metals, and parameters. The same custom attribute. This is a simple design. I don't want to tell my developers, well, on fields use this, but on methods use this, and on parameters use this. I want to have a single API, easy to communicate. So these are my two elements of design. And now, how will I implement that? I mean, switch to code. It is still an example in, the, in GitHub, but this one is not done to be simple. It is done to make the example of, of an end-to-end -end design process. So this is the, the authorization example. So let's start um, with the framework. There are a lot of things here. So let's see my require permission. Well, I made the framework abstract. So I will need to, get to, to go to the base class in a moment. Uh, here you have a few constructors and logic to create the permission. So actually the, the custom attribute or the aspect has the, the logic to create the permission. It is not itself the permission. OK, let's, let's look at the base now. So you see, this is not directly an aspect. This is an attribute. It is just a normal attribute, but it is an aspect provider. And the aspect provider basically here is doing a switch case according to the target element. So when the target element is a method, I will add the method authorization aspect. When it is a property or a field, I will add a location authorization aspect. When it is a parameter info, actually I need a method authorization aspect, but I also need to validate not the this parameter, but the other parameter. That's what I'm doing here to say, to, to say which parameter should be validated. So this is my API. I don't want developers to see this logic inside, to, to, to have to care about adding aspects differently or attributes differently to parameters than to methods than to, than to properties. So I care about simplicity. Um, now let's look at the method authorization aspect. 
This is an on method boundary aspect. Here I implemented the, the interface, not the base class, but it's equivalent. The base class is just easier to, to, to get started with. Uh, one hour remaining, that's fine. Okay, and so when we enter the method, if we have a permission for parameter zero, which is this, do we require the permission and then we go through all, through all arguments and we require the permission for this um, if it is needed. So, and then we have similar logic for location validation. Here we implement I location interception aspect and on get value we require the permission for reading and here we require it for writing. And so this is the framework. Now how it can be used in practice. Here is an example where all permissions are, are by default. So it takes read or write to well, the read or write permission to to access the the properties. But here, okay, here is an example where to change the business unit of an invoice, I'm asking a different permission, a signed permission. This is one of the permissions in Microsoft CRM, which I took as an example for this design. So if I, if I want to move an invoice to a different business entity, I need a different, different permission. So this is the aspect-oriented part of the language. And then you have the the, the object-oriented part of the API where you create a role-based policy and you say that on all classes everyone has read, read access by default. But this is now, typically you would have that in, uh, you, you could have that in code or you could have that in the database. This is just here uh, to minimize dependencies. I don't have a database. Um, and here is a code that uses that, but this, that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is that, oh, I forgot one part, sorry, it's unclear. On the base entity, I'm calling apply default permissions. And let's look at the implementation of this thing. So this is a multicast attribute. I enabled inheritance to make sure that it is propagated to all my entities. And this is an aspect provider. The aspect providers go through all fields and properties. It looks if there is already a required permission attribute on this location. I will not do anything. But if there is no, I add, um, I add a permission here. Uh, I guess there is a bug I need to, to fix there in this example. But this is, this is the idea, is that we use an aspect provider to add everything by default. And um, this is it for this example. The, so the point of this example is to show how we go from requirements, business requirements, is how to implement an authorization framework. And then you have kind of the requirements to do something usable for developers. You say, oh, I will have default permissions and I will have one single thing and then you have this layer of abstraction uh, single thing this single custom attribute and then you have this layer of abstraction that maps your API to the aspect implementation and you see how the aspect implementation uh, is blended with object oriented programming this is not a separate world this is just uh, another feature in your compiler and it will use your, your, your authorization framework, your, your object-oriented framework. So I tried to bridge these two. And um, there is much more. So I've shown something little about the aspect framework. I didn't talk about what happens when there are many aspects uh, on, the same, um, on the same declaration. I didn't show you how to do aspects that have many transformations inside the same, the same aspect that's also possible. I didn't show much about validation of code. Uh, 
I didn't show uh, trading stuff, logging stuff, caching, I didn't show all that. So to get started, you get your free license with the URL I gave before, you download the product, you enter your license key. Um, the samples are there, everything is there, and documentation is pretty complete there, so you can get started very quickly. And it is time to conclude with a bridge. This, this is a bridge between Africa and Europe in Turkey. And um, is it Asia? Geography is terrible. Anyway, two continents. <laughs> These two ones in Turkey. On one side, you have machine languages. Say it is here. Machine languages. Um, and machine language, you know, the, the requirements of the machine for the language are pretty basic. It, it needs to be Turing complete and it needs to be uh, efficient and allow to express uh, efficient things like SIMD operations, for instance. So these are the requirements of the machine. And on the other part of the bridge, we have um, um, human beings. And the way they are using languages, we are using languages, is different. We are using to reason, to communicate, to write poetry. Do you know this new programming language, Rockstar programming language, where you can write code that executes and at the same time looks like lyrics of uh, rock, rock songs. Check that out if you haven't done already, Rockstar programming language. So that's not a good example, but OK. We want to bridge that gap. And we cannot bring the human closer to the, the hardware. Well, we, we can, but not, not many human beings are willing to do that. So what we are doing is to get the programming languages closer than the way human beings reason, not talk, just reason. Some languages try to be talkative, like COBOL, for instance. Cobol didn't copy the way we reason, but the way we think, it, it was a terrible syntax. And compilers must do more to raise abstraction level, to, so to add, to, to bridge that gap, and to add this support for patterns. Uh, I hope that a few decades from now, this will make it to uh, uh, mainstream languages, and uh, this way of reasoning with patterns will become mainstream. Uh, in the meantime, I'm here to talk about that and uh, say it's a very good idea to look at it this way. Thank you very much. That's all I have for today. Thank you well, thank for the you opportunity. Very much.